What's up guys, Doug Polk here and welcome back to another episode of Poker Hands. And today we got a double header lined up for you. Two straight hands that I played on Poker Night in America last weekend. Let's go ahead and jump into the action. Sorry, I'm slow. You're usually right on these. Yeah, I'm tired. I need to wake up. I need to get some espresso, except I'm afraid I'm gonna get a couple more milk again. I tried, I don't think they... <laughs> They're funny though. You order a cappuccino and they ask you if you want flavor in it. Our first hand begins with me opening it up in the low jack with King Queen off. Kelly Winterhalter decides to go ahead and call here in the high jack, which is a little bit on the loose side. In general, I would lean more towards 3 bar folding this kind of hand in the high jack. Anyway, she decides to call and then action folds to Kane Callis in the big blind with ace jack. With ace-jack off, I like his decision to go ahead and call. It's a hand that plays well post-flop, can give you some strong top pairs, and also isn't the greatest hand to 3-bet for value. Let's go ahead and take a 3-way flop. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think around here people just order like the ice, no, like the ice drinks with like the sugar, and I think that's more standard than the traditional. The flop comes queen 10 9 with two hearts, and everyone gets a little something to go with. Kane Callis flops an open ended straight draw to the nuts on one side and the back door nut flush draw. I flop top pair second kicker with, kicker with a gutter, and Kelly flops a double gut shot and a kind of concealed looking one. She'll make a straight neither a jack or a seven. Kane checks, and now with king queen, I think you can make a reasonable argument for either better check. I lean a little bit more towards check as I did here in this hand because I think it adds some, prote some protection to my checking range. Also if I bet and get raised, yeah I have a pretty easy flop call and definitely some turns where I can improve and call as well, but in general my hand will be awkward on later streets. In a lot of those spots I go for the passive line and try to beef up that checking range. So I check and now it's over to Kelly who has a really good candidate hand to bluff. She can improve to essentially the nuts versus a check call. You know, check call range is not going to have a straight. On a seven and on a jack, she'll have a hand that definitely will have some value. Also, her hand has no showdown value, so it's another reason why I think I like a bet. And she definitely will have a wide range of value bets here, including strong queens, some two pairs, and also some straights. This is definitely a hand that she's going to want to work into that bet range so that she can have enough bluffs on later streets. Anyway, she decides to go ahead and check back the flop, and we take a turn. Based on how weird they look at you when you order a cup of tea, you know? Yeah. Uh, I so, I think I got sabotaged. I got a wake-up call, and they just never called. I woke up super late. It's bad luck. <clears throat> So now that he has my book, David, what's your what's your greatest strategy at the poker table? What do you think made you successful for such a long period of time? Honestly, yeah. not even as a troll, like being a chameleon, just being able to do lots of different things and lots of different, be able to play lots of different games, be able to play in lots of different lineups, be able to play against any type of player. You're a pretty badass chameleon. Thanks. So how would you play? You. How would you play today on TV differently than what you did normally? How much is that? I can't give. I can't give up all. I'll give out all the information. Just we're gonna have pieces to just, of it. We're just gonna have to tune in uh, for that. But how I play today might not be how I play tomorrow. Might not be how I played yesterday. I'm, some people are only able to play one style of poker. I'm able to. So you adjust to whatever the table I can was. adjust to whatever my mood tells me to do that day based on lots of situations around me. The turn is the six of hearts, which is sort of a funny turn because everyone's hand gets a bit better. Now Kane has the nut flush draw to go along with his open ender. I pick up the second nut flush draw and Kelly hits a weak pair. I'm sure she's not too thrilled about that. Kane in the big blind now really could decide to do any of three options. He could either bet, he could check call, or he could check range, check raise. They're all on the table here. He does decide to go ahead and check, and I don't mind the decision. Now over to me with king-queen, very clear turn bet for value. 
My hand was close to being a value bet in the flop, and when the action checks through, you definitely want to bet hands like this on the turn. So I decided to bet about $325, around two thirds pot. Now Kelly quickly gets out of the way, 6-8 even though it has improved to a pair, it's not a hand you want to call with on the turn, and the action's back over to Kane. Now I think you could make some pretty reasonable arguments for call or raise, but I like the decision to raise. If he check raises here, he's going to have a ton of equity against basically any hand that decides to bet call, other than a couple of strong flushes. Let's just say I have a hand like a queen, or even if I had a hand like a turn set. He can still win on a king, an eight, or a heart, so really his hand has a ton of equity against my range. Additionally, given the fact he has the ace of hearts, I now cannot have the nut flush, which is one of the hands you have to most be worried about when making a play like this. You could maybe make an argument that he should just call here on the flop. He does have some showdown, some playability across rivers. But when you check raise with this hand, you don't have to be worried about getting three bet because you know your opponent does not have the nuts and also does not have the nut flush blocker. So all in all, this check raise looks really good to me. Back over to me with king queen and I have a very simple call. I could have a few other queens like queen jack and I could also have some stronger hands like the nut flush or, or a hand like 6-6. Six, six. I also would consider checking back queen queen on the flop sometimes, given that I block a bunch of the hands I'd want to call down with, I like mixing in some top set traps. Anyway, I go ahead and call and let's take a river. But being able to adjust is a pretty valuable tool I think in poker. And what about you, Eric? I don't know, I never win. <laughs> I just play for fun. I think you're lying at the poker table. That's an angle. What do you know? That's an angle. Line, That's an angle. He says he never wins. He's a loser yeah. and he's really the biggest winner in show history. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> wow, it's so rough. We win one time. What about you, Kevin? <laughs> Me? Yeah. What's your, what's your best asset? Just poker being basically. psycho crazy. Psycho crazy? Oh, that yeah. Psycho crazy. You should, you should have mean? said you play very tight. That was the wrong answer. <laughs> Are you trying to angle me by acting like you're psycho crazy, but you're really tight? <laughs> I might be. Okay. She's got all the moves. That's, yeah. a, all lot. The that's angles. a lot of moves. All the angles. That's a, that's I guess I gotta moves. go with this one. I don't even. King. <laughs> <laughs> the river comes the nine of spades pairing the board, and Kane decides to go ahead and bet $2,700. Now, I think that this is an interesting spot. The big blinds range is not in a great place here on this river because the player that opened preflop can certainly have a hand like queen queen or 6-6 six, six, and those hands are almost always going to be the nuts. The reason is because when the big blind check raises you on this board, they're really saying that they have a flush or maybe a straight. A hand like two pair is probably just going to bet and doesn't really have enough hands to get called by that are worse to go for the check raise. Maybe a hand like tens or nines could go for the check raise. But then the thing for those hands is if it goes check, check on the turn, it's pretty bad for them as many hands have a chance to suck out. So when he check raises me on the turn, I think he's saying that he has a straight, but probably a flush if he's value betting. This means that this river is pretty bad. While he can still have a bunch of flushes that beat me, I can certainly have a hand like the nut flush or queen queen or 6-6, six, six, and those hands are all going to want to go all in. If I have a hand like a boat on the river, I don't see any reason I'd want to go less than all in, even though yes, it's a pretty large jam here. My opponent's range is relatively capped at a flush, which means I should be using an aggressive size here facing a bet, and you could maybe argue that the big one shouldn't have many bets here at all. In general, in spots where your range does not improve very much, and you have still some value from the turn, but your range does not improve to the nutted hands that your opponent can have, it does make sense to mix in some more checks, and if your opponent bets and you're in the spot where you can have those boats, don't be afraid to go all in. Now, it's a bit interesting here to decide which hands I want to bluff with. You could make an argument to call with King Queen and Jam Queen Jack, and I think that'd be pretty reasonable. I did not want to have the Ace of Hearts in my hand though. I want him to either be bluffing with that card or to have a hand like a flush because a flush is in a tough spot facing a jam. So I think having a blocker to a boat and a blocker uh, like a king, I think the king is relatively neutral, frankly. I don't think that it matters much one way or the other, but I want to bluff with a card that blocks boats if my opponent could potentially check raise with a hand like queen nine. So 
I think of the hands that bet the turn and call raise, my only real candidates to bluff with are a hand like maybe king queen or queen jack. And so I think in retrospect, I like a call here with king queen uh, and a bluff jam with queen jack as well as jamming with my boats. This is obvious. Look at one card. Uh, mine is Hold more. Tournament with this, right? Yeah. Um, Not too difficult to take it down when your opponent doesn't have anything, but let's go ahead and jump into the next hand we were dealt in for. I think you, you said 27, right? Yeah. I think yeah. you gave me too much. Yeah, it was 28. How much do you have? It's 28. Yeah. So you think your stick has hurt you more than it's helped you? Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, 28. Okay. Honest dog. Give me a stack of black dog. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thanks. But it's helped me enjoy Almost every time I go to play. So. I think uh, entertainment. If I'm here to pocket hundreds on bets, <laughs> entertainment is a big part. Here of for it. the wrong reasons. For me. I, I, I've gotten to the state. So <laughs> on TV, just like <laughs> I know. I don't only play in the twenty-seven hundred games that I have fun and I enjoy. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pass on. A, I'll pass on a game that might be better financially <laughs> for a game that I enjoy. I play too much poker to not have fun at the table. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That was good. Cool. Oh, this again, huh? Every, every straddle. Every you're just straddle. like, here we go. Free money from Doug. Well, I mean, stop by. Make me work for it, but yeah. I straddled up to $100 under the gun, and the action falls to David Baker, who raised to $300 with Ace Three suited. Everyone else decides to get out of the way, and I look down into the straddle at Jack Eight off. I call, and let's take a flop. Well. Even with all the dogging and stuff that I do, I, I kind of look for opportunities to... The flop comes ace, eight, seven, rainbow, and I flop middle pair while David Baker flops top pair. I check over to him and he decides to check it back, which I like with some of your weakest top pairs. That way when you check back and play the turn, you will have some pretty strong hands that can call down and value bet in later streets. Anyway, the action goes check, check, and let's take a turn. Help people in their lives, like his friend, poker player and just came through the marriage boot camp thing I did. Him and his girlfriend, and they came through and it helped. The turn comes another seven, which is a very interesting card. On one hand, in the big blind, I'm gonna have way more sevens than the player who opened from early position will. But on the other hand, when, the, when he checks back the flop, he's generally saying that he has some showdown value or maybe a hand that's kind of weak. So when the turn comes another seven, that's a, a card that certainly could hit some open hands, like 9-7 suited or 7-6 suited, but also if he has a hand like a weak ace, he's now not going to fold at pretty much any point if I bet and bet the river. This means that I'm not really likely to bet too many hands here on the turn. You could maybe argue to have a small bet range of a few different hands, but given that the big blind won't have pairs like kings through tens, and also won't have as many ace-x hands preflop, it doesn't really make that much sense to be betting here. Now, the player that open won't have very many strong ace-x as those hands will be betting the flop, but at the same time, they have improved here on the turn some of the time, whereas the big blind has tons of shitty hands. And of course, by big blind, I mean straddle. Anyway, I check it over to Baker, and now I think he can either bet or check. I like both of his options. One of the cool things about betting here is you can get some thin value, and you'll be protected because you certainly could have a hand like 9-7 or 7-6 suited. This means if the big blind wants to go to town and start check raising you a bunch, you have some protection in your range. However, he does decide to check back, which is fine, and let's take a river. They had really good things to say. So it was great. Oh, you're, are you like a therapist? I'm kind of a game master. So the marriage boot camp's about you play a bunch of games, drills, exercises, and it's life enriching boot camp too, and you learn about yourself by playing games. It's like poker. Right. I mean, you learn a lot I think five. over time. Whereas if you just, somebody teaches you or you write a book about it, you're not going to learn anything. Right. So most people in their marriages, they go to counselors for one hour, talk them to death, they don't get anything out of it. Right, I, that makes sense. So we have like 120 games we make couples play. That's Learning cool. Game. Any of them poker games? No, I can't, I can't figure out how to get poker in there. Strip poker. <laughs> Yeah, but if you have two couples, that's probably not oh, going to help the marriage thing out. Yeah, that's awkward. We normally have like, normally have like 50 couples. Yeah, okay, gotcha. 
And some people you just don't want to see stripped down, I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Fair. I mean, you the river comes a king, and now in the straddle, I would be looking to bet with a bunch of hands. If I have an ace, I'm certainly looking to go over some value. I might maybe check one or two weak ones to have some top pairs when I check, but in general, those hands are going to go for a value bet. If I have a king, I'm probably looking to check call. You want to make sure to have some pairs that are strong enough to go for the check call. If I have a hand like a full house or maybe a strong seven, I'd be looking to check raise, try and get more value from an opponent that's checking back a weak ace twice to value bet or someone trying to go for a thin bet in the river with a hand like king queen or really any king of course being the same value. So I check it over to Baker and he decides to bet 500 and now I'm in a bit of an interesting spot with an eight. His bet size is on the larger side so I don't have to defend nearly as many hands. Also, this is a board where the operator's range should be a, a good amount stronger than the big blind's range, so I also don't have to call with too many of my holdings. So in this situation, I'm looking to fold with my high card hands, check raise with some good trips, check raise with some boats, call my weak aces that don't bet, call every king I check with, and now I need to pick out some other hands to bluff raise. Well, my best eights, even though their kickers are relevant, some part of my eights are some of the best hands I can choose to bluff with. This is because, yeah, I mean, it's not likely he has a hand like 8-8, but it does block if he decided to play 8-8 or 8-7 like that, which is good. And also, there's not really that many other hands that have significant removal. I'm not going to be able to check raise with a hand like a king, because if I call, I might chop with some of his value range. Also, if I have a hand like queen high, it's not like that hand is particularly good anyway. In fact, in some ways, it's worse because I block some bluffs he might want to bet with. In general, if he is bluffing here, he probably has some kind of high card hand, maybe a hand like Queen Jack, Queen 10, or maybe a really low suited connector that did not decide to bet flop return. But in general, those hands as bluffs check as bluff check raises will have basically nothing good going for them. Well, an eight does have something good going for it, and I need to pick some bluffs, so I decided to use Jack 8 here. I'm gonna balance it out with my trips and boats, so it makes sense as a balance strategy. As far as what size we're looking to go for, we want to go over something pretty big because we're saying, hey man, your ace or king isn't good, I have trips or a boat, and that way we can bluff with more hands. Remember, the bigger the size you go, the more you can bluff. So facing $500, I decide to put him to the test. With the action back over to Baker, he has a pretty tough spot here with a weak ace, but here's the bottom line. You can't continue when you only have king-king, which is really the main good hand he can have here. He can also maybe have a hand like aces if he trapped flop and turn, but I think that hand might look to bet somewhere earlier. So really in this spot, after having specifically second set, an ace is his next best hand. So when you have an ace in this spot, you have to think about it. What does my overall bet range look like? Look like? Am I going to bet kings here? If you're not going to bet with any kings in this spot, which I think would be a little bit too conservative, then yeah, you can look to fold some aces. But if you're going to have bluffs and king x and ace x, then you're going to have to probably look to call when you have an ace. In that situation, an ace is one of your strongest possible hands, and even though your odds aren't good and your opponent can definitely have some value bets, if you just fold without thinking about it, then they can start to exploit you. The most important thing to think about in this situation is what price does my opponent get on their bluff? And in this case, my price is really terrible. I'm risking something around $3,500 in order to win a pot of only around $1,200. So he can certainly mainly fold, but he still has to find a call something around 25-30% of the time. Now a weak ace is going to fall into that, but he can maybe pick amongst them which aces does he want to call and fold, but certainly he needs to give that some thought. It's also worth, worth noting if he did bet a king, I think a king would be a very reasonable hand to go for a bet and if facing a raise, look to jam. Remember, he can definitely have king-king and maybe even a trapped aces, so you want to put the big blind in some really messed up spots by jamming on them some of the time. In deep stack poker, it's important to remember that in spots where players' ranges are capped from pre-flop or post-flop decisions, you want to use big sizes to put them in very difficult situations. If I did check raise here with a hand like a 7, I would be in a lot of pain if I faced a jam. Now if I had a boat, I would probably just check raise and call it off, but I'm more likely to have a 7 than a boat, and even if I did have maybe one of the worst boats, like a, like a boat like 8-7, I don't really block anything relevant that my opponent's representing, of course being aces or kings.
So all in all, tough spot here for Baker. What will he decide to do? I mean, you go, you go to these senior events, you know, and you just don't want to see the cleavage and stuff hanging out at the senior event. Folks it's got like, his mojo. It's back. like under the table and everything. It's like, Making some hands. That's over the top. Oh, is that what's happening? Hit that subscribe button, and I want to thank you guys for joining me for this doubleheader poker hands.